Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and after re-watching all 13 Fox X-Men and Deadpool films in our X-Men rewatch, I think I discovered the long-lost legacy of this forgotten film franchise, the secret connection buried in its convoluted timelines that Marvel Studios might be ready to resurrect in the MCU, starting with Deadpool and Wolverine. So this video is going to be our finale to our X-Men rewatch series, as I connect the dots to finally make sense of all these films. I'm going to quickly go back through all 13 of them to explain what they were really trying to do with this X-Men film franchise, picture to picture, and with their crazy timeline. And as they go through, I'm going to figure out what I think should be the definitive ranking of these films, because I think we misunderstand what their legacy should be. Okay, so let's start with the first X-Men in 2000. This movie, of course, set in the not too distant future that was understood to be around 2003, and it just introduced us to the original lineup, and it's a really great cast. Wolverine's origin was left a mystery, and he was established to be older than Professor X, and we were just like, who is this guy and where did it come from? And it kind of did these great things to set up the X-Men world. Like, like Charles's classroom had these younger mutants in it, Jubilee, Mirage, Kitty Pride. But this first X-Men film, directed by Brian Singer, really took some big swings. Magneto was established to be a child survivor of the Holocaust at Auschwitz. And that's how this franchise opened. In the 90s animated series, they couldn't even say the word Nazi or the Holocaust. But here was a superhero franchise that told an alternate history set in the history that we knew. And because Lauren Schuller Donner was the executive producer, this is where Kevin Feige got his start on Marvel films as an associate producer. And it's important to remember Remember that Kevin Feige was a USC film school kid who did not grow up reading comic books, but he just loved Richard Donner's Superman so much in Star Trek that he ended up working for the Donner Company. And when he got assigned to X-Men, he self-taught himself everything about comics. He read everything he could get his hands on, and he became an ally to Hugh Jackman on the set of that movie because Brian Singer would ban comic books from the set. And then after this movie, that's when Kevin Feige left the Donner Company to work for Marvel Entertainment, and he produced all 2000s era Marvel movies. Really, this first X-Men movie just nailed it with the character introductions. It took some bold swings, and it has some really great memorable moments. The final battle on Liberty Island, Magneto tearing apart the train car. All these hold up as great sequences, and you really just cannot beat how great Hugh Jackman is in this film. So on my list, it's going to be number five. But moving on to X2, X-Men United, 2003. This is set a few months after the first X-Men film, so we're still roughly in 2003. And this is one of the all-time best superhero movie sequels. And think about it, from X2 in 2003 to Spider-Man 2 in 2004, Marvel movies were cooking in this era. As far as we could see, there would be no need for an MCU. Now we could overlook the 2003 Ben Affleck Daredevil. That's how good these two movies were. And there was that moment where Mystique looked at Stryker's computer where dozens of X-Men characters were listed. It kind of felt like it was the animated series come to life. This was a heavily populated mutant world and it was awesome. The mutants were now dealing with serious social and political issues that took them to the White House. Brian Cox as Colonel Stryker remains one of the best ever Marvel movie villains. And this movie is just great sequence after great sequence. Alan Cumming as Nightcrawler in his White House attack. And then the response to to that as Stryker's forces assaulted the X-Mansion and Wolverine had to defend it, going to Magneto's Hannibal Lecter-style prison escape. And then we got to go to this interesting scene with Bobby Drake's family. And then the Blackbird nearly crashes and Nightcrawler catches Rogue from midair. Then the invasion of Stryker's lab with Mystique. And then Wolverine fighting Lady Deathstrike. And then Magneto pulling an incredible twist by weaponizing Cerebro. So with this movie, Brian Singer established himself as a top director who seems like he could speak on complex subjects, but also this really shielded him from from scrutiny, and that is a complex part of this movie's legacy. Like, notice how Alan Cumming did not ever return to this franchise. Just imagine how fun he would be in all X-Men movies that came after. Still, this movie is so good on its own, and it ranks number two on my list. Okay, X-Men The Last Stand in 2006. So of all the movies on this list, this movie is pretty high up there when it comes to movies that changed, that got better upon rewatch. It's definitely a drop off from X2, but really just for the cast alone, it remains stronger than most of the other X-Men films that followed. It is the highest domestic box office of any X-Men X-Men film other than the Deadpool movies. Domestic, overseas, some of the other movies did better. The Golden Gate Bridge sequence was at the time one of the most expensive special effects of all time, but it holds up. It looks incredible. And it lifts the entire film upon rewatch. Kelsey Grammer just makes a great beast and just has some really fun chemistry with Hugh Jackman. The VFX on Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen in the opening scene really holds up. The Danger Room battle feels like it's the 90s series in the best way. But really, this script just suffers from a director handoff from Matthew Bond to Brett Ratner. And then the script tried too hard to be both a cure story storyline and a Dark Phoenix storyline, and Vinnie Jones was a Matthew Vaughn holdover that Brett Ratner turned into a joke, and because they viewed this as the end of a trilogy, they just killed off way too many characters. Cyclops, Professor X, Jean Grey, lots of the mutants on Alcatraz. Mystique was implied to be depowered, though presumably she regained them. They really just edited this movie to hell, and the best parts of it are in the deleted scenes. There's too many mutants in the woods. Team Omega is just not very memorable, and rather than lean into the LGBT themes of Bobby's character in X2, they pivoted to stick him in this lame love triangle with Rogue and Kitty Pryde that leaves everyone 
everyone just looking stupider than they were in the previous film. And they reassigned the LGBT themes to Warren Worthington, aka Angel. But Ben Foster, who was one of the best working actors in the industry at the time, is given nothing to do in this movie, really. And it's hard for me to even rank the movie, so for now, I'm just gonna put it in an unsorted category. I'll rank it at the end of this video. But this movie left Fox in the worst possible crossroad because it made enough money to give them too many options, and it closed too many doors with character deaths, and it just made too big of a star out of Hugh Jackman Wolverine. And that's really where Fox went next, and you can't blame them. X-Men Origins, Wolverine, 2009. It's another movie that honestly got better with rewatch somehow. It's easy to forget how watchable Hugh Jackman is and how much his charisma alone could carry a film. It's a further descent from X-Men The Last Stand, but it lives up to its promise as an interesting origin story for James Howlett, aka Logan, aka Wolverine, as a wanderer and a forever soldier who fought Lieutenant Dan family tree style in several American wars. Now this movie is directed by Gavin Hood. David Benioff co-wrote it and it jumps from 1845 to Vietnam in the 70s and then Team X in the late 70s to the main events of the film in the early 80s. And Team X is surprisingly enjoyable this film. Ryan Reynolds as Wade Wilson, Dominic Monaghan as Bolt, Will I Am as John Wraith, Kevin Durand as Fred Dukes, Daniel Haney as Agent Zero, and Liev Schreiber as Victor Creed. Their attack on that Nigerian drug lord's compound was really fun. Taylor Kitsch shows up later in this movie and would have been really fun as a Remy LeBeau in this franchise. We did not need to see Channing Tatum ever. The twist of Kayla Silverfox spying on Wolverine in order to protect her sister really holds up. Even the decision to make Weapon 11 Deadpool a sealed mouth killer, I believe is just misunderstood because that was supposed to be a primordial form of the Deadpool character that would then become the Deadpool that we know in a sequel. It has the legacy that it has because fans just didn't really pay attention to what this movie was doing. And honestly, Ryan Reynolds' ego. There was an original plan for Deadpool in this movie that the studio hasn't really let go of, and we even saw that when Deadpool revisited the scene in Deadpool 2. But this movie's final act just goes to shit. Like Stryker's adamantium memory loss bullet, it's just kind of a cheap move. This movie's attempt to give origin stories to other X-Men like a young Scott Summers really just falls apart. And then this moment with the young mutants running to a DA Charles Xavier, it just looks really low budget and really just hurts this movie's memory. But because I liked it in rewatch, I'm gonna also put this in the unsorted category. Okay, X-Men First Class 2011. So back when this movie was being made, Fox did not want to let go of the X-Men branding and they decided to work with Matthew Vaughn again in this 60s retro film with a younger X-Men cast, including James McAvoy, Michael Fassbender, Jennifer Lawrence and Nicholas Holt, and Kevin Bacon plays the villain Sebastian Shaw from the Hellfire Club. This movie has some truly amazing sequences. It recreates the Auschwitz opening from the 2000 film and it expands it with even more heartbreaking moments. Michael Fassbender is awesome as a vengeful Magneto, killing former Nazis in Argentina and then slowly moving Shaw's coin through his head to kill him. We get this awesome historical tie-in with the Cuban Missile Crisis. And before this rewatch, I totally love this film. I had previously ranked it my top five, but now upon rewatch, I gotta say, it dropped. I think Matthew Vaughn might be a bit overrated and much of what we previously embraced as like horny British swinger humor now just feels out of character for someone like Charles Xavier. And you know, in 2011, America and Hollywood was just weirdly obsessed with January Jones and Jennifer Lawrence. And while Jennifer Lawrence has good chemistry with her co-stars, the studio really tried to make her the new Hugh Jackman star of this franchise. And I think it was a mistake because Mystique only has relationships with certain of the X-Men and she's never really been a leader. That's not why she's fun to watch. And for a movie set in the 60s, I gotta say this movie doesn't seem to understand what the 60s were all about. It kind of just uses the 60s as set dressing like it's Austin Powers. And it's weird because this movie came out during Mad Men, a show that did an amazing job of unpacking the 60s decade and its themes. And it just felt weird to do an X-Men movie in the 60s when the X-Men came out in the 60s in the comics. And it really had nothing to say about that decade other than, you know, nuclear brinkmanship was a big deal. I talked about this recently on an episode of the Sneak Peek that 2011 was just kind of a weird year for movies in Hollywood. Every studio was looking for their next J.J. Abrams before Hollywood realized that J.J. Abrams was not, in fact, the next Steven Spielberg. And he shouldn't have been the prototype. Like, he's a good director. He's just not someone that you should duplicate with other people who are trying to do what he does. So it was big time for directors like Colin Trevorrow and Josh Trank and Matthew Vaughn, who's not really trying to do what J.J. Abrams does, but it is someone who I believe does better with a smaller budget film. And you'll notice Hollywood was also pulling like TV directors, Joss Whedon, the Russo brothers, Drew Goddard, Game of Thrones directors like Alan Taylor, and they gave them all huge budget movies and not all of them did well with it. Meanwhile, directors like Alfonso Cuaron, Alejandro Iñárritu, Denis Villeneuve, they were all doing amazing work. They just didn't want to do these big franchise movies. So yeah, again, 2011, just a weird year, which isn't, you know, first class's fault, but I feel like the studio let first class get away with stuff that they wouldn't in other years. And the fact that so many of these supporting cast mutants were killed off in later movies or in between movies or Darwin in this movie, which makes no sense, it just kind of tells you that the franchise didn't totally know what they were doing with all these characters at this point. So I I'm still uncertain about it. I'm going to put it in the unsorted group for now. I'm bringing us to The Wolverine in 2013. Enter James Mangold, beloved director from Walk the Line and 310 to Yuma, who knew Hugh Jackman weirdly from the rom-com time travel movie, Kate and Leopold. Technically, this was a sequel to X-Men Origins. Wolverine is now living in the woods and we learn more about his World War II history as a witness to the atomic bombing in Japan. And
and he gets brought to Japan by the Shinjin family, and he learns the Patriarch, whom he knew in World War II, now just wants to steal his healing ability for his Silver Samurai suit. That bombing sequence, along with a high-speed trade sequence in Logan's haunted status and his struggle to heal, just makes this a really strong entry. The movie is extremely bloody and violent and very rewatchable. It might be the most approved upon rewatch, and it would be a perfect film if not for the Viper and the Silver Samurai final battle. The movie just totally abandons what made it so good in the first two acts. Maybe James Mangold didn't have the studio muscle that he would have later in his career to make the kind of film that he would have wanted all the way through it. But what's crazy about this film is viewers forget that it was not a standalone movie, and there was definitely a plan by the studio to tie this into the broader narrative, to set up Days of Future Past in the Essex Corporation slash Transigen plot for Logan. It had a crazy post credit scene that randomly resurrected Charles Xavier Patrick Stewart and brought back Magneto's powers. So again, I'm also unsure about this one. I'm going to add it to Unsorted, but I promise I will sort the Unsorted by the end of this video. This video is sponsored by Blue Chew. Look, what you do in your bedroom is your business, but if your business could use a little boost, then it's time to call in a consultant. And the best consultant you can get for your bedroom business is Blue Chew. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night. That way you can plan ahead or be ready for whenever an opportunity arises. It's super easy to do. Just sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And it's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. If you're skeptical or don't think you need it, try it free for a month and see. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Come, chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our audience. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code New Rockstars at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. Promo code New Rockstars to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring our channel. Bring us to X Men Days of Future Past in 2014. So Brian Singer returns to the franchise and Fox is ready for a major crossover event that combines the eras. And this movie rocks. It doesn't really follow Days of Future Past from the comics or the animated series, but it is its own solid time travel storyline that uses unstuck consciousness time travel like we saw in Lost in Slaughterhouse 5. This movie starts in 2023 in a dystopian Manhattan, and then Logan goes back 50 years to 1973 to prevent Mystique from assassinating Bolivar Trask and accidentally giving her DNA to the Trask company to create deadly shape-shifting sentinels in a future that imprisons the mutants in camps. But I encourage you to watch the Rogue cut of the movie, because that puts Anna Paquin Rogue back into the story as she was intended to be, because her mutant absorption powers were supposed to be part of the sentinel technology. We also learn in the Rogue cut that Pyro survived last stand because we saw a Zippo lighter in a memorial. This movie has also great sequences. We get this opening death montage as the mutants are being hunted. We see this awesome sequence of Quicksilver breaking Magneto out of prison with this awesome time in a bottle sequence. And then the final act, the editing of the Sentinels attacking in the future while Mystique is dealing with a moral crisis and whether or not to kill President Nixon. It really takes the best elements of Brian Singer's directing work from the era of X2 and the historical tie-ins from First Class. And it uses just the right amount of Wolverine in the story. It's a true ensemble story. It feels like we are back in the 90s animated series with this type of movie. It ends with the X-Men franchise restored with the 2000s era film alive once again in a new perfect timeline set in 2023-2024 and we get a little tease of Apocalypse. I love this movie. I'll rewatch it all the time. I rank it number three on my list. Next, Deadpool 2016. Ryan Reynolds willed this movie to life, scoring a budget for a test footage with Tim Miller and then leaking that footage so fans would demand the full feature. Deadpool essentially took over the franchise here. But it's not the raunchy humor that makes it work. It's really the amazing action and stunt work, and that, to me, has been what's missing in the MCU and what Deadpool and Wolverine has the most promise to contribute. What remains so impressive about the 2016 Deadpool film is how efficient the story is and how they do so much with so little. It's one of the best structured superhero screenplays ever written. It's an origin story, but it stays in the present, and it's really just one long sequence on a freeway, and then they punctuate it with these great moments, like the 12 bullet countdown or his argument with Colossus. Like, Deadpool has such great chemistry with Colossus in this movie, and you forget that Colossus is a CGI character that they brought to life with five actors. Really, this movie just had the levity that all the other X-Men movies were missing. I rank it number four, only because it's less of an X-Men movie than it is just a Ryan Reynolds movie, and I believe characters should be bigger than the actors who play them. Okay, bringing us to X-Men Apocalypse 2016. This came out a few months after Deadpool in 2016, and it's why the X-Men franchise, I believe, has such a sour legacy. Because at this time, Marvel Studios was 
fucking socking dingers. Hit after hit. Civil War, to Doctor Strange, to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, to Spider-Man Homecoming, to Thor Ragnarok, to Black Panther, to Infinity War. You cannot beat that. By comparison, the X-Men franchise would just take these wild swings in quality, and it was just impossible to keep up. So as a sequel to X-Men First Class and Days of Future Past, we are now in the year of 1983 in a revised timeline with Oscar Isaac as Apocalypse, back from his hibernation, seeking four horsemen to remake the world. And really, this movie ended up being to its predecessors what Last Stand was to X2, a huge drop in quality, and this movie just feels like even lesser of a derivative. Brian Singer lazily restages the hits from Days of Future Past, like we get another quick silver sequence in the X-Mansion set to Sweet Dreams, and honestly, I'll go to the grave saying that it is not as good as the Time in the Bottle sequence. It's just over the top, and basically it shows how Quicksilver can stop time. And if you get stop time, was anyone in that mansion really in danger? Really, this was Brian Singer's breaking point with the franchise. Simon Kimberg essentially had to take over this movie, and you can see it as you're watching. And for a movie set in the 80s, it doesn't really understand what the 80s were about other than nuclear brinkmanship and then pop culture set dressing. The franchise bet big on Sophie Turner, and I don't even think she wanted to be this big of an action star. She does seem like she's been fun to work with, so I rank it next to last on the list, number 12. But you know what? There was a plan by the studio. The post credit scene set up Mr. Sinister, and I think Fox and Kinberg wanted to set up an alternate doomed future after Days of Future Past in which mutants had been eradicated through chemical alteration in the food supply starting in the 80s and the 90s. And that was happening in the background of this movie. It's just characters didn't sense it yet. Yeah, Peter Maximoff, there was more danger in that can of tab than there was in the exploding mansion. Okay, Logan, 2017, James Mangold is back, following up his 2013 Wolverine with, beyond a doubt, the best X-Men film. It's an easy number one, folks. Not just because it sets itself apart, it actually does more to fit into the X-Men canonicity than other titles do. It references past battles. It's another Professor X Wolverine team up, and they're talking about their past as if it's ringing through their memories. Logan has to travel with X-23, Laura, who's one of the X-23 subjects who were created with the DNA of famous mutants like himself, as well as Bolt and Avalanche from a transigen Essex facility in Mexico, and he has to bring her to the Canadian border. This movie is a Western in the style of Unforgiven in that it demythologizes superhero movie tropes and themes, but it's also kind of a sci-fi story with a bleak, grounded outlook of our future with AI and screens everywhere, conspiracy theories, poisoned in the water supply and food supply, and constant medical testing that we all just look past. Now, Logan was meant to be the ending of the X-Men era, but also the beginning of a new X-Men era with Laura Wolverine, and it shows the end result of the Essex Big Bad, perhaps even after Mr. Sinister himself would be dead. In the end, mutants will always be exploited, always be on the run, no happy endings, only the chance at peace. Now, the one flaw of this movie is the mutant power application of the other X-23 kids. It's kind of boring. Like, half of them just use the power of moving plants. But Daphne Keene and Hugh Jackman more than make up for it with bloody, bloody violence and just amazing stunt work. It's incredible. I can't say enough good things about this movie. It also just leaves a great mystery of the X-Men comics that exist in the universe of this film. And I think our rewatch answered the question that maybe Colossus might have consulted in drawing them. If anything comes out of this rewatch, we answered a question that we've always had for like seven years. Okay, Deadpool 2, 2018. Since the 2016 Deadpool made so much money, this sequel was like an immediate green light. And I remember liking it mostly the same as the 2016 movie, but it also really dropped in quality upon rewatch, I gotta say. Deadpool tries to kill himself after Vanessa's death, and he finds a new life as an X-Man, and he tries to protect Russell from Cable. He gets involved with the X-Force, but then like really everything in the movie is a joke, as they just really just use time travel to fix all of his problems. Deadpool's relationship with Cable, when you think about it, is almost exactly his relationship with Russell, and with Dopender, and Colossus, and Weasel, and Blind Al. It's not really relationships, it's just like Ryan Reynolds, Ryan reynolds zine at everyone. Like, he wouldn't even let someone else play Juggernaut. I say this as someone who really loves what Ryan Reynolds does in these movies, it's just a bit too much. Like, we don't really get to see Deadpool as a member of the X-Men, it's just more of like a plot point and an excuse for him to make fun of the X-Men and other superhero movies. With David Leitch directing, the action, though, and the stunt work remain on point. Like, the skydiving sequence with the X-Force dying, the truck chase with Domino, it's all incredibly directed. I just think this is a movie you only need to see once, whereas most other X-Men movies get better with rewatch. So I'm gonna group this into the unsorted group for now, but onto Dark Phoenix 2019, the sequel to X-Men Apocalypse, and Simon Kimberg pitched it as a Logan-type ending to a franchise, but eh, it ain't Logan. It says goodbye to characters that audiences were really done with after Days of Future Past. Sophie Turner is just not up to the challenge of this movie, and like Mystique, she's really cast as like yet another female pawn in the power struggle between Professor X and Magneto. It underutilizes half of its cast. Evan Peters and Alexandra Shipp don't really get to do anything in this movie. It's set in the 90s, but it doesn't tell us anything about the 90s. It's just yet another Dark Phoenix attempt that feels like it's a lesser interpretation of the storyline than the animated run or the Chris Claremont comics. It tries to correct the mid-aughts approach of making Dark Phoenix a mental health crisis as opposed to a cosmic force, but it resulted in a lesser movie that didn't really establish the cosmic landscape of this universe. Dark Phoenix should be cosmic horror, and we have yet to see that. This movie was greenlit back in 2016-2017 before 
for the Disney buyout, which was Fox's attempt to retain the rights of the X-Men IP. And they essentially let Simon Kinberg retry Dark Phoenix because really there was no one else they trusted in the wake of Brian Singer's exit. And it just seems like Simon Kinberg might've been stretched too thin. He was also consulting on Legion at the time, which was a way better X-Men property from Noah Hawley on FX. There are just no good sequences in this movie. The villain, Jessica Chastain's Dabari shapeshifter Vuk is completely unmemorable. The settings are ugly and uninteresting. The colors are bland. This movie's not even fun to look at. Unfortunately, this ranks at the bottom of our list, number 13. And I don't think I'm gonna get an argument from any of you on that. It's just hard to imagine this 90s X-Men lineup aging in 10 years to look anything like the awesome lineup we met in 2000 with Famke Jansen, James Marsden, Patrick Stewart, Halle Berry, and Ian McKellen. But you know what? We were in an alternate timeline on a path toward Logan and New Mutants and what Fox originally wanted to do beyond it. So let's talk about that here. Final entry, The New Mutants 2020. Josh Boone was given the keys to do a soft reboot of the X-Men franchise again with a spinoff group loosely connected to the world of Professor X and the rest. Mirage, Wolfsbane, Cannibal, Sunspot, and Magic, and an Essex-controlled mental hospital run by Cecilia Reyes. Unlike Dark Phoenix, Josh Boone did lean into the horror aspects of being a mutant, making this movie kind of like Dream Warriors, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, The Shining, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And along with the Wolverine, I believe it is the most improved title on this rewatch. For now, I'm going to put it in Unsorted, but I'm, I think I got an idea of where I'm going to put it. You could see this franchise continuing with a star like Anya Taylor-Joy. She is really the willing action star that Fox was looking for from Sophie Turner and Jennifer Lawrence. And again, Fox did not consider this story to be standalone. With X-Men Apocalypse, Logan, and New Mutants, they were definitely laying the seeds for Mr. Sinister to be their next Thanos-level big bad. They wanted John Hamm to play him. Others had been pushing for Brian Cranston, but I think they were just doing that because those two guys were the big anti-heroes in Prestige TV in the early 2010s. Boone said that they wanted this trilogy to lead to an Inferno movie, which would have given us Madeline Pryor, Goblin Queen, maybe even Sophie Turner and Macy Williams reuniting. Now, would X-Men Horror have worked for three movies? Maybe not for big bucks, but you know, smaller movies with smaller budgets? Hey, maybe that could have been a lot of fun. Mr. Sinister was, and perhaps remains, the plan though. Like, since the events of Days of Future Past, I believe Fox wanted to reveal that since the revised Nexus Point of 1973, Nathaniel Essex has been controlling the genetics of mutant kind. And that is something that they could definitely pick up with in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. All right, so let's end with a definitive ranking. So we got number one, Logan, number two, X2, number three, X-Men Days of Future Past, number four, Deadpool, and number five, the original X-Men 2000. Then we get the unsorted group, X-Men Origins Wolverine, X-Men First Class, The Wolverine, Deadpool 2, and The New Mutants. We have to sort those, but easily at the bottom of the list, number 12, X-Men Apocalypse, number 13, Dark Phoenix. Okay, so of this unsorted bunch, First Class and The Wolverine are the strongest, and Wolverine is the most improved, while First Class, just not as much upon rewatch. So I'm gonna say number six, The Wolverine, number seven, X-Men First Class. Okay, then I'm gonna be a bit controversial here and add The New Mutants right in the middle of this list. Number eight, The New Mutants. I just can't really fault the film, it works. It may not live up as like an X-Men film, but we get to see some really cool exploration of mutant powers and psychology. And with all the release delays, it honestly gave them a bit more time to make this movie's effects and visuals look really cool. I think it only has the vibe of a movie you watched just once because it didn't lead to any sequels. But if Marvel ever brings back Anya Taylor-Joy as magic, a lot of people are gonna go back to this movie and realize how good it was. Okay, so next up, as much as I appreciated The Last Stand more upon rewatch, I really do prefer the action of Deadpool 2 more. So I'm gonna say number nine, Deadpool 2, and number 10, X-Men The Last Stand. And I know it feels harsh to rank The Last Stand this low because it did a lot of important things for the franchise and it was still a big hit. I just beg all of you to rewatch that movie and live through all of Brett Ratner's story storytelling and all the forgettable mutants who are hanging out in the woods and how torn this movie feels between the Cure storyline and the Dark Phoenix storyline and I think you'll agree with me. So then at the bottom of our unsorted bunch I gotta put X-Men Origins The Wolverine. It's certainly not the worst X-Men film but man it was a mess. So there you have it the full list. How do you rank the X-Men movies? Do you think I was wrong about any of this and how do you feel about this franchise revisiting it upon rewatch? Comment down below with your thoughts. Thank you so much for supporting us through this franchise. We're gonna move on next to our look at the Fantastic Four four films, the 2005, the 2007 movie, and the 2015 movie. I can't wait to re-explore those. You can follow me at EA Voss, subscribe to all three channels of the New Rockstars Network for breakdowns and news coverage of everything you love. Thanks for watching. Bye.